same thing happened right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. How many grizzly bears are roaming loose in the woods in this county right here? Zero, right? How many grizzly bears were roaming around Milwaukee area 500 years ago? Probably a whole bunch of them. Well, what happened? As people move in and civilize an area, the big, dino, the big creatures, or ferocious creatures, are driven off or killed off. It happens all the time. If it came on the evening news tonight that there were five grizzly bears roaming around Milwaukee, Wisconsin, do you know what would happen by 6 o'clock in the morning? Every redneck in four counties would be out there with a rifle trying to shoot them. <laughs> right? And whoever could shoot the biggest one would be a hero. They'd put his picture in the paper. Hey, Bubba shot the grizzly bear and saved the village. <laughs> that's exactly what would happen. Well, that's what happened to the dragons. Man, if you could figure out a way to kill a dragon, you'd be a hero. They'd tell stories about you around the campfire for generations to come. And there are thousands of stories of people killing dragons. They killed them off for meat. There'd be a lot of hamburger in one brachiosaurus. They killed them for medicine. It's amazing how many ancient recipes call for dragon bones to be ground up and put in with the medicine. Lots of legends tell of people killing dragons. Gilgamesh supposedly slew a dragon. A Chinese guy named Yu slew dragons that were bothering them as they tried to expand the territory and drain off the swamps and make the land of China livable again. They had to drive off the snakes and dragons. The Babylonian god Marduk is shown pictured on top of a dragon, possibly a fire-breathing dragon. You say, oh, you don't believe in fire-breathing dragons, do you? Oh, yeah. The Bible talks about a fly, fiery flying serpent. The book of Job has a whole chapter, Job 41, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. It says, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. I've seen deacons do that at Southern Baptist churches. <laughs> As out of a seething pot or cauldron, his breath kindleth coals and a flame goeth out of his mouth. There really was a fire-breathing dragon. In our green series of tapes, the topical ones, we've got a whole tape out there, hour and a half, about Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon. If you get a Catholic Bible, you find the book of Daniel has two extra chapters, Daniel 13 and 14. It's part of the apocryphal books. It shouldn't be in Scripture. It's interesting reading, but it's not part of Scripture. It says, There was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. But give me leave, it means give me permission, O king, and I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together and made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder. What a strange story. Let me give you the Hoven translation of what's going on here. The Bible tells us Daniel was a man who understood science. He knew full well that pitch is made from tree sap and it's very sticky. They used to have whole industries in America just making pitch to use to waterproof ships. They would coat them with pitch made from tree sap, particularly pine. And fat is very salty tasting and just about all animals like salty tasting things. The, the hunters put out salt licks for the deer, right, or cat, cattle have like salt licks. And hair won't digest. He mixed them all together, tossed them in, the dragon liked the taste, swallowed them, but they wouldn't digest. And these were the days before Roto-Rooter, and so he burst asunder. Mm -hmm. You figure it out. Anyway, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Hussein, thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. The guy has a serious ego problem. He thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar brought back to life. By the way, do you ever notice George Bush always called him Saddam Hussein? There's a reason for that. I've been told, anyway, the word Saddam means prince. Saddam, spelled the same way, means horse's rear end. <laughs> but Saddam thinks he is Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. He's got his picture in front of Nebuchadnezzar on their currency over there, their gold coins. He spent a fortune rebuilding the ancient city of Babylon. Did you know ancient Babylon has been rebuilt? They always knew where the city was. It was destroyed about 600 B.C., but when Babylon was, they, you know, just buried in the sand, forget about it, they dug it out and the sand had really preserved the bricks extremely well. The old brick walls of the ancient city of Babylon were very well preserved in the dry sand over there. And they found carvings of lions and carvings of dragons. 
Now, how did they know about dragons in 600 B.C.? Well, that had been almost 2,000 years since the flood. So from the flood up until, you know, Nebuchadnezzar reigned is 1,800 years. Probably most dinosaurs were gone by then. But I think a few were still around. And he had one in a cage, apparently. In 300 B.C., Alexander the Great reported his soldiers were scared by dragons when they conquered part of India. This Roman mosaic was made in the second century after Christ. It shows two long-necked dragons fighting or kissing. Boy, that would be necking, wouldn't it? Wow. Uh, anyway, how did the Romans know about dragons in the second century after Christ? St. George is famous for slaying dragons in 275 A.D. He finally got killed because he was a Christian. Beowulf slew dragons. You ought to try to read the Beowulf story in Old English. We sell the book only because it's such interesting reading. The Old English is, I think, impossible to read. That's English, folks, from 1,500 years ago. Our language has changed a little bit, okay? Probably the peak of the English language was about 400 years ago when Shakespeare and God chose to use the, make the King James and all that stuff about that time, about the peak of the English language. But the Beowulf story says Beowulf killed Grendel the dragon by pulling off one of its arms and the creature bled to death. Strange story. You know, they found a Babylonian cylinder seal showing a guy pulling the arm off a dragon. There are dragon legends from countries all over the world. Ancient pottery, like this one, probably one of the oldest pieces of pottery on planet Earth, from the eight, uh, first dynasty of Egypt, shows two long-necked dragons. Looks like dinosaurs to me. Here's another one showing two long-necked dinosaurs holding a sheep between their mouth, between their mouths. This hippo tusk was found in an ancient Egyptian tomb from the 12th century B.C. It shows an animal with a long neck and a long tail. Why would there be dragon legends from countries all over the world? Thailand has many legends of the dragon. China, of course, is famous for its dragon legends. The uh, gargoyle that you see on the corners of the buildings in Europe, you know, apparently came from the story of a gargoyle, uh, they called it a dragon, that came up out of the water in France. That's where the gargoyle legend comes from. There's a Russian medallion shows a man killing a dragon. This Bulgarian postage stamp shows a guy killing a dragon. An Irish writer said they killed a dragon with iron nails on its tail. Well, the Stegosaurus had awful big spikes on his tail. We've got a copy of one in our museum there. There are dragon heads found on the ships that the Vikings used to sail around. Here's a Viking uh, woodcut showing a dragon swallowing a man. Taken from a book called Vikings by Tony Allen. 11th century picture. That's just 900 years ago. They were still talking about pe dragons swallowing people. The Vikings put dragon heads on their ships. Interesting. Get the book After the Flood by Bill Cooper. Excellent book about what happened to Noah's sons and how they spread out, if you like, the genealogy type stuff. He's really brilliant at that. But he mentions many of these ancient people talking about having to fight dragons. You can get that book from our ministry or on our website, drdino.com. Siegfried, the famous Norwegian hero, slew the dragon Fafner about a thousand years ago. Marco Polo lived in China about 800 years ago, 750 years ago, and said the emperor in China was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. Why would he come back and tell a story like that? Well, I think it's because the emperor was raising dragons to pull chariots in his parades. That's, that's my theory of why he said that. Did you know in 1611, the old Chinese law books tell about they appointed the post of royal dragon feeder? Why do you need a royal dragon feeder? Mm, let me guess. Uh, to feed the dragon. Yeah, right. A city in France was renamed Nurluk to honor the man who slew the dragon. The Indians used to carve pictures on the cliffs of Grand Canyon and all the canyons out there. One of the pictures they found shows a dinosaur. Now, how did the Indians know about dinosaurs to carve their pictures on the walls of the Grand Canyon? Well, maybe they hunted dinosaurs. Hmm. In 1925, some scientists went down one of the canyons out west, just exploring that region, and here's what they wrote. The fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories. Oh, you poor fella. They upset his theories. Hmm. He said... Facts are stubborn and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts, the theories must change. The facts remain. I agree. That's the way science is supposed to work. You can have any theory you want, but if the facts don't square with your theory, throw your theory away. 